Okay, let's go. Um, thanks for coming in, Mark. Thanks for having me, Andy. Thank nice. you. I've been listening to uh, podcasts. I think you're doing a good job. Well done. Nice one. Cheers, mate. So, your chance to tell us what you've been up to um, Well, martial arts-wise, I've um, just returned from Israel. I went there last month, November. Cool. Um, I just did an instructor course in Krav Maga, which is in a Israeli martial arts. So I just returned from there. Right. That's... Israeli military and police use that is that right yeah I mean it's it, it's called a martial arts but basically it's it's taken a lot of martial arts influences styles and systems and they've incorporated it to reality so they use it in the military and police but it's been rolled out around the world because of its effectiveness so it's quite um quite a savage art really um it's for realism um and so I thought I'd go to where it's where it comes from. I've actually done Kapap, which is the mother of uh, Krav Maga. Right. But Krav Maga is the one that people will know, especially in Western world, because um, due to movies like Born Identity and things like that, it, it, it's quite, that's Krav uh, Maga. That's Krav Maga that right, uh, cool. like Matt Damon did in in films like that. Um, so it's had a it's had a quite an explosion around, um, especially around America and UK in the last five or ten years. Um, but bef yeah, before that, it's been it's, it's used in a, a, a lot of uh, like um, military and police forces around the world, especially US. Right, cool. So who were you tra doing your training out there with? So I went to meet a guy called Moshe Katz, and he's, his company is IKI, which is based just east of Jerusalem. So he's... he's uh, very well respected uh, instructor in in Krav Maga, um, and he travels all around the world to teaching seminars. But I actually went to his house, where he's got a set up in his cellar, and people from all around the world go. And I did a five day instructor course at his house. Cool. Um, so he does them two, three times a year, but and then he's teaching around the world. It was it was good to actually go to his go to his home and. Uh, experience that yeah excellent experience all right cool so what took you there obviously i know i know why you're going about rich combat, yeah rich combat but why is that useful to you um well my my outlook now is all about realism i want to know what works in a real situation so obviously all my backgrounds martial arts which self protection self protection yeah. yeah um but i'm that's what I teach at the moment is realism and self-protection. And probably the nearest style or system to that would, would be Krav Maga. Um, just for the reasons being that it's not um, a competitive uh, system, so it, it doesn't have a competition aspect to it. It's basically... It's, they have, there's no sporting field. No, there's no, sp no, there's no sport theme to it. It's taken... Um, influences from all the, the all the martial arts so it's got judo and jiu-jitsu it uses grappling um western boxing for for the hands so it uses all these all these different styles and systems and incorporates them into what works in a real situation which is kind of where i'm at at the moment that's what i'm interested in but even on saying that i still think krav maga has its own limitations as well so yeah. um but basically i went over there because because of its effectiveness yeah. and I wanted to I wanted to kind of learn I, I want, well I wanted to see the culture behind it as well I mean that, the trip was fantastic for yeah them. I was gonna say it's not just I mean you know that's the um, the reason you were there in Israel but you know on a on a personal kind of traveling aspect what what did you get up to while you were there between training yeah well I was unfortunate because he it, the two courses that he does through the year, he does a thing called Tour and Train, which is a ten-day course where you will, as it as it as it suggests, tour and train. And Moshe, who takes the training, is a historian as well. He's, he writes a lot of books on the history of Israel and the and the warrior aspect and the mentality of the Israelis. So he, he knows he incredibly knowledgeable on the history of Israel and its troubles. So he incorporates that into his training, whereas you will train 
with him and then you will go and do the the tourist aspects and he'll show you around so i was unfortunate the dates didn't match i couldn't make the 10 day course but luckily i did this bolt on which was just a five day um just training which yeah. was fantastic the long days we started at 8 30 on the morning till six at night and also two evening sessions long with the locals session. very very long very long sessions tiring yes tiring yeah um just mentally tiring it wasn't as though it was um full-on cardio work or um full-on training all the time there was a lot of there was theory to it as well but it's just a long time for concentration so mm. yeah there were long days um so i had to do the touring aspect of it i had to do on my own so i managed to go into uh, jerusalem um and have a look around the sites and and obviously pick pick Moshe's brains and um, a few of the locals because it wasn't wasn't like a conventional holiday <coughs> excuse me it wasn't like a conventional holiday where you know I was actually in the community so where I stayed there wasn't any hotels you mm. you was a bit like Airbnb type there was people yeah. in the community who would put a bedroom up for you yeah so I was staying with the locals um and then I'd walk through the neighborhood to train in um and then with Moshe and his assistants, you'd go, you'd all eat together, uh, yeah. chill out on an evening together. So it was, you know, was, I got a Sounds chance to cool. see the, the community. Yeah, good. And what sort of other guys were out there training with you, kind of, you know, was it all kind of people learning to be instructors or getting their license? You know, was it kind of, you know, or was it a mixed bag? Um. A lot of people were there for work, so there was a lot of people who, military, some ex-military there, some um, serving military, mm. uh, people into close protection. Um, but there was also there was a like there was a rabbi there from Pittsburgh, who who actually he was the rabbi for the the synagogue where they had the shooting in October, okay. the mass shooting, um, and he was there because he wanted to learn Krav Maga. Yeah. For the community, there was a, obviously a calling for it. Yeah, um, they'd never had anything like that before, so he was there because it, I guess the you know community is really unsettled and it, yeah, and as through my experience, people who come along to learn self defence, it's normally the aftermath. Yeah, it's it's too late. You know, people are coming along because they've had this incident in their life. They've had the realisation that... They've had the realisation how unprepared they were, uh, how it can come straight out of the blue, and and then they could come along to self-protection. So, yeah, there were, there were, there were guys like that there. There were people without martial arts background, um, wanting it on a practical level, but majority of people were military, close protection. Yeah. Um, I think it's cool that, you know, these, these courses, a lot of people can be put off doing them because they think... I don't, I don't know anything. It's going to be, you know, guys who know what they're doing and I'm just turning up for the first time. But most places will accept zero experience, won't they? And, and take... Oh, they, they, they want zero experience, yeah. absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's certainly opened up now. When I started 20, 30 years ago, you, you, you know, it was a very closed shop. The styles and systems were very locked. They, were, they didn't even delve into, they didn't even talk about the other other styles and systems mm. out there. Um, but as for what, so that creates a kind of closed, closed shop where it becomes intimidating to go into that arena. Yeah. So, and that's that's changed, that's evolved over the years. Um, and now as as people want business and they want people in there, they will do anything to get them people through the door mm. but you, you're right by saying that it's it's very very hard to walk into it. well certainly at that level of, of when you're talking about yeah. Krav Maga and things like that but even at um going down to sporting levels or to to karate and judo and boxing to get to get young people or well any any person to walk through the door the first time yeah it's a bit it's a bit like it's a daunting. double whammy isn't it if something's happened to you you've kind of had this I don't know, you know, unprovoked attack, you're out having a drink and a good time or what, whatever it is and bang, it's happened. Yeah. And then the thing you need to do or the thing that's playing in your mind is, oh, should I just learn to, you know, go out there and just recognise these signs and go to some, where I maybe could have defended myself. But the double whammy is you're already vulnerable from the attack and then you've got to step into what made you vulnerable, which is violence. Correct. Yeah. 
which is with apparent people who know exactly what they're doing. So it's like a massive ask, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, massive ask, yeah. And that's down to whoever's running the course to allow that to be, to feel yeah. safe and okay. If, if you do your research and you go to the correct people, because there's a lot, a lot of good tutors out there, but there is a lot of charlatans and there's a lot of rubbish out there as well. So you need to do your research, you need to ask about, and, and if you go to the correct club or correct organisation or teacher... There is no calumny between other styles. They will they will be open about and they will put you on to other styles and systems as well. So whilst you're coming in and learning off these guys, you'll, there's an openness there that they will be putting you on to, to what your actual needs are. Some people just want to be there just for a new hobby, a new interest. Some people want it on a very practical yeah. level. Yeah. Some people need it for work. Some people... They have the, there's a demand for it through an experience. Yeah. And yeah, so there's all these. And, and what happens is that people just put out an advertisement and trying to try and put a fishnet out to get everybody in. Mm. And that they're selling people short by doing that, you know, by, yeah. by if you're putting yourself out there as a self defense system and then the people are coming along and you're playing games and you're just doing fitness work. Yeah. Or you're just all about the competition. Yeah. Then. In, you know, you're getting people in on false pretense. Yeah. So kind of need to know that individual and the, you know, their reasons for being there. It's kind of, it's got to be personal, personalized. Yeah. Really. Yeah. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, that's where you are at the moment. You just got back from Israel. You, you know, you got your license for Krav Maga now, um, which is useful for rich combat, which is your your setup, isn't it? Which yeah. is um, reality, self defence, predominantly, uh, amongst other things. But yeah, predominantly that. Um, so a bit of backstory about you, I guess, Mark. You know, I know you started in karate. So do you want to tell us a bit about that? When, where, and how? Yeah. Well, I try and come away from the. Obviously, with Rich Combat, the, the martial arts aspect and try not to advertise it as a martial art, um, but obviously, it's it's that's that's where it's come from and that's everything, especially on the physical aspects. I, I do a lot on the on the psychology of of, uh, of violence, but on the physical aspects, it all comes from my martial arts background. Um, so I started at I was thirteen when I started, so mid eighties. And my background's karate, so I, I did karate for about 15 years before I started to look at anything else. Wadaru. Wadaru, yeah. Wadaru. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gets pronounced differently, so no, don't worry about that. Um, so I suppose I got into it through through the movies. I was obsessed with uh, Bruce Lee when I, was a, when I was a kid. And I saw one of his, well, his last completed film was Enter the Dragon, um, which I still think stands a test to this day. And I was obsessed with that. So I was obsessed with martial arts, obsessed with Bruce Lee. And my dad suggested going along to karate. And like mid-80s, there, wa- there wasn't the options there is now. You either did karate, judo, boxing, and that that was about it. So I went along with um, to karate at the uh, Leeds University. And it was Shotokan, which is probably the the main style in karate. Certainly at that time, it was a, um, the biggest one. Um, I didn't know the difference between the styles at the time, which you don't, it's just karate to me. And I went along to the first lesson and hated it, to be fair. Um, it was marching up and down. It was very strict. Um, and I just didn't take to it. I didn't like the pe- I, was, I didn't take to the people that were there. I didn't feel welcomed. So I come away from it very, very flat. Um, and that was it. That was my experience. One lesson, and I didn't want to go the following week, so we didn't go. Then I, then it wouldn't go away. I was still obsessed with martial arts, uh, and I think it was another movie that triggered it. Probably an early Van Damme movie, which is absolutely yeah. terrible. <laughs> um, but another, another, it wouldn't go away, and and then we saw an advertisement in the paper again, and went down into Leeds City Centre. And it was in a hotel. They were doing an enrolment. Advertisements in papers. Advertisements even, in papers. This is back in the eighties. Yeah, no internet. Um, so I went 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 down there, and 
I loved it. It was this. This was Wadaru, so this was a, a different style of karate. You had felt a sp- welcomed everything. Yeah, I yeah, felt cool. Well, it wasn't just that. Yeah, there was uh, there was still that um, kind of outsider. I still felt a bit of an outsider. I think there's always going to be, isn't it? It is a you know, it, you are vulnerable walking in there. Just you know. yeah, yeah. It was a lot a lot stricter than it is now. Um, but I loved it. It was um, that. So this Wadaru karate w- was different to Shotokan. They brought a sporting aspect to it, and they brought some street into it as well. So there was there was like um, a totally different vibe and feel to it. Mm. And I was obsessed from lesson one on that. Mm. Trained there, did karate for for many many years, um, and changed instructors a few times, but kind of stayed with with the same organisation. And then I did that for fifteen years. Um, Got into competitions, did several of them. And then I got to a, a point where I wanted to, I felt unprepared for self-protection. So I didn't feel like it was serving me on a self-defense basis, which is what, what I wanted at that time. So yeah, I, let's just, you kind of, you got into competitions, you were England international uh, in the team that, Went to the World Championships, is that right? In two thousand and two. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Let's so... just go back to that. Tell us, <laughs> tell us what happened there. Um, it was in Italy, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, obviously, you start. You're doing local competitions. So I was doing okay at them. Um, you're on a circuit. You're fighting the same lads. You you you're going around the country. Um, so I was doing I was doing uh, local competitions, doing okay at that, and then I had the chance to go try out for trials for the England team. So me and another guy from the Barnsley club, I was at Leeds at Barnsley club, um, and we went down for trials and we got selected. We had a yeah. we had a good um, good session, we got, and we got selected for the England team. And so yeah, I went along to the World Championships, which was fantastic. So they were in um, Italy. I did two in Italy and one in England. Um, so I did, yeah, I did three world championships, which, are uh, every two years, um, uh, which was with, with the WKF, which is the world karate federation. There's a, a lot of people now, a lot of staff set up the others and there's people are calling world championships and they just grab another club from, but this was like a, this was a proper work, you know, the proper yeah. setup. Yeah. And we went along to that. Um, so I did two in Italy and one in England. Um, and then in between them, you have the Europeans as well. So I did a couple of them as well. Um, <laughs> come on tell, tell us about the the finals Matt the, so uh, the big yeah um, so I got a silver medal I got a, I got a silver one of the first year that I went I absolutely bombed so you're entered into two you're entered into a traditional competition and you're also entered into the um, continuous competition so the different rules but it's the same people and the same weight categories but in fact, you you the under slightly different rules. So the first time I went was in uh, Venice, and I lost both both <laughs> matches first round, <laughs> early bath. But a great experience. But I just realised how how much I was out of my depth. Um, so that was that experience. Then I really knuckled down, started doing some training, started really going the extra yard, going down to Birmingham where the the sessions are held, and started training a lot. And then went the next one was in. Um, was at Pisa so I went back there and it just opened up for me unbelievably um, when I think back now it was probably written I, sh- I should have won it uh, firstly I got two by so the, the big categories I was in the under 70 kilogram category which is like around the 11 stone mark but the big big categories and it's basically you're up against another fire and it's a straight knockout yeah. So you might start with sixty-four fighters down to thirty-two, sixteen. Yeah, yeah. So it's just you win, you win, you go through, you lose, you're out, and that's yeah, it. You two, go two minute bout. I got a buy in the first two rounds, which yeah. is unheard of, especially at World Championships. Yeah. I don't know why. I think first one there might have been an odd number. Yeah. Second one, the guy didn't show or whatever, yeah. but I got two buys, unheard of. Then I get a third buy through an injury. <laughs> so I'm thinking this is all right. <laughs> So yeah, got through to the quarterfinals. So I had a good not taking a hit yet. <laughs> yeah. And then I got through, I got I I, I did I had a good run. I, I uh, got through the next two fights. So I'm there in the world final uh against an Italian, so it's a, yeah. on his home home, <laughs> home soil. 
And I um, I was one nil up, which you, obviously I don't want to go in the rules. It's my good time to yeah. go in the rules. But I'm one nil up, and there's 14 seconds left. So you have a big clock on the on the table at the side where the judges sit. Yeah. So obviously you've got one eye on on that and yeah. one eye on your fighter. And I'm looking. I'm one nil I'm up. I'm just thinking karate kid. Yeah, very very <laughs> similar. One nil up. 14 seconds to go. Yeah. And you're allowed to step off the mat. You're allowed to step off the mat twice. Yeah. And it's it, it's not detrimental. Okay, you can step off, you just get a slight warning, but it doesn't affect the scores. Yeah. He has me cornered and he, he scores a point. So when I look back now, it was just a terrible mistake. I should have stepped off the mat with the resetters and, yeah. we'd, and we'd have carried on. Yeah. So hindsight. Hindsight. He gets, he gets the score, one all, and then it goes into an extra time and I lost. So that was that story. <laughs> 14 seconds away. 14 seconds medal. away. Well, never mind. Um, so yeah, that put you off the um, sporting side of it forever. <laughs> um, no, um, yeah, it's just strange, isn't it? How you know, even in that last fourteen seconds, you lose that focus and it's just gone. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not trying to depress you here, mate, but yeah, it's just. Uh, it's just funny, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so and so obvious when you look back, certain things. Um, so yeah, you went from kind of the sporting side um, of you know combative arts, uh, however we want to put it, martial arts, and you wanted to go into the reality um, side of things because I think I'm right in saying that the reason you initially went into karate was for self protection and to kind of make you feel more comfortable in, in environments, but you began to think that maybe it wasn't going to help things in a reality situation. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's the breadcrumbs. Isn't it? I can look back now and, and, and see, see the story there. Yeah, I probably did start through insecure. So you're at school, you're looking at the bigger lads, and I'm thinking, I can't protect myself. Not that I had any trouble or I was bullied or anything like that. But it was I, just an, uh, just an a, intrinsic kind of just mm. a feeling. Thinking I wouldn't mind knowing how to learn how to defend myself. And if that big kid come at me, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so although I got into it through the movies, uh, I was obsessed with martial arts through movies. But yet, probably there was that side of it as well. I wanted to learn karate as self defense. And when you're walking into it blind, that is exactly what you think you're getting. You're going to learn there and you're going to learn how to fight. You're going to learn self-defense. Then when you look 15 years down the line, I've not really learned how to defend myself. What I've learned is a sport. And an art. And an art, an art and, a, and a competition aspect to it. Mm. And so I've, I've then it's evolved into doing competitions. So mm. I've now gone down like a sporting aspect. Yeah. So then, yeah, I had a, I had a, did a few competitions and what have you. But then I started to think I was bored of that. Um, I come away when I, I, I come back, I, I stopped going with the England team and I was still competing at local level and it was just dead to me, it was gone. So I went on to another circuit where people didn't know me, me and another guy, Chris. Mm -hmm. And we started going around the country and entering competitions because nobody had know us there. Yeah. And, and we would just go to these open competitions yeah. and turn up basically just to... To, to do something new and exciting for us on a yeah, personal yeah. level. Yeah. Now, at that kind of level, they're very, very biased to the referees and judges. So it's the same guys that are winning the competitions. Yeah. You never, when it becomes a 50-50 a shot, they're always going to side with their fighter. Yeah. Yeah. So we wasn't getting very good results anyway, but it wasn't about that. It was about... to keep your interest. It was our interest. Yeah. I was trying to fire up some interest in competition. Mm. And then that became very boring as well. Yeah. So then I started really thinking, what what do I want out of martial arts? And I, I started to think back to why I'd started and about that if I now, so there I was 15 years down the line with, uh, I don't know, the time I'll have been a second, third damn black belt or whatever, but yeah. I, I, I didn't know anything about self-protection. Yeah. If someone had started any trouble with me, yeah. I, I was just like anybody else. I would have, I would have yeah. not known how to protect myself. So I started looking into that just through interest, really. Yeah. Um, so when I started looking out of karate, I started looking into people who was out there doing real self protection, and there was a lot of good, good things out there. A lot of good things. 
And I started to do a lot of studying, a lot of reading and realizing that for self-protection, the two things that you need to know, especially to start off with, is you, is you need good hands. Yeah. And the people who've got the best hands are the boxers. Yeah, Western boxing. And then grappling, I needed to, you know, you start looking at statistics and that 90% of fights become a grapple. I needed to know how to grapple. Yeah. So I thought, right, I'm going to go learn how to box and then I'm going to go learn how to grapple. Yeah. And that was the plan. So I went off to Dewsbury and I... I got with Crawford Ashley at the time, who was the uh, ex-boxer. Yeah. And for, uh, Dewsbury lad, he, he'd got a, a gym there. And I walked in there and it was totally different to anything I'd ever experienced. Totally yeah. different. Walked in there, there was no, there was no um, pretense there. You were straight on the pads. Yeah. It was straight, straight there honest train. training. You're there to yeah. train. And if you don't like it, don't come yeah if you like it you're more than welcome yeah. and that's what i liked there was no there was no um marketing there they wasn't bothered about business yeah it was plainly just they was there boxing if you yeah. want to come and join us come yeah. and I, I liked heard, that i heard an interview with dorian yates talking about um bodybuilding saying the same about his gym some people would be put off about it other people would be drawn to it yeah but it was there to work yeah which same same yeah. uh, scenario isn't it yeah. So I went there, um, and what was very, very interesting was there, um, straight on the pads, you know. And I, I'd, again, like I say, I've done fifth. Although I've done, I've done fifteen years of uh, martial arts. I'd done hundreds of rounds of sparring. Here I was going into a boxing ring. I was Can getting absolutely get... pummeled, and I mean absolutely pummeled. Yeah. I had no, no answer to a, a basic jab. Everything yeah. comes off the jab. So there were guys just popping me on the end of the jab. Yeah. And I just, well, it was a fast learning curve. So I, yeah. I, I went away for that f- first sparring session. I'd not even got close to the guy, here, you know, thinking I know about range and movement. Yeah. But it was totally different. And But that is what I wanted. Yeah. So I knuckled down there. And within three months, you start to get your own shots off. Yeah. And you learn very, very fast. Strange, isn't it? When you go into a new arena and then all of a sudden you, you know, you get hit. I'm talking metaphorically there. It doesn't matter what the arena is, but you know, you're seeking it out. You want to go there. Yeah. You, you always, whether that's any, any kind of transition, it hits harder than you think. Yeah. And it's going to take time yeah. to just remold. Yeah. And um, yeah, I can kind of relate to that. Go on. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that was, but then again, same, um, I was hooked, although I was the bottom of that class, I was hooked on the on the whole setup, the sport, and that was it. I was I started to become obsessed with boxing. So then <laughs> although I'd gone there for on a on a practical level, I started getting drawn to the comp to the sport and the yeah. competition side of it. Because yeah. so you were only planning you know, I was only planning months. to yeah, I I was thinking I could drop in for three months, yeah, um, learn a few few little tips off them yeah. and, and job's done yeah but no i was having to start from scratch and yeah. i was an absolute novice um so yeah i had to if i wanted to learn it i had to start from from the bottom but then i contradicted everything that i'd, I'd gone there for by getting drawn into the competitive side of it yeah. enjoying the rounds and the sparring yeah. and then thinking oh i won't mind having a, actually yeah. having a having a fight here yeah so i um decided to well, the actual club that I was at didn't really do that. They didn't really do the um, the pro boxing. Um, so they put me on, um, a, a guy I knew put me on to, I changed clubs, I went over to Meanwood and started to train with the professionals over there with the intention of uh, applying for my licence and, and having a fight. To have a pro fight. To have a yeah. pro fight. Um, again, I was full on board there. So I was training f- Training with the pros, I used to train about four or five o'clock on an evening before the uh, general public come in. Mm. So I was tr- I, I was lucky enough to get invited to train with eight, to these guys, and again, bottom of the class, but you're on a fast, steep learning mm. curve. Um, I was training daily with these guys, fitness, the full works, yeah. um, fitness pads, sparring. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, so that, then again, I was embroiled in 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 the competition side of things 
which is not what I'd so gone for. you were moving away again. Yeah. Yeah. You d- was it Meanwood where Nicola Adams... You yeah, there was, um, there was... There was qu- obviously quite a few pro boxers, but Nicola Adams was there at the time. She was um, just starting off in, in her career, so she was she quite was Leeds, well... Lass. Yeah, she's from Leeds, yeah. yeah. she's um, She was the first uh, woman's Olympic boxing champion. Yeah. But yeah, she's from Leeds. She was just... She was quite well known in the area around Leeds. Mm. Uh, she was just starting her career. So yeah. there were people like that there. It was, uh, yeah, it was a, again, yeah. Um, very Couldn't tough. Drag you up to a certain Tough level, training. Like a beginner or not, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, tough training, but fast, fast learning curve. So fantastic. So you were going for your license. And what happened? <laughs> yeah, well, at that, I mean, at the time, um, I was going through a divorce. I was, I was working a lot. And as I was getting closer and closer going towards the license, I, I started to train less and less, which is obviously not the way to go. So I'd started at, I was training five five day, five day nights a week. I was moving shifts around, um, um, training every night. And then I started to train four nights a week due to things that was happening in my personal life, then yeah. three nights a week. And yeah. then before I know it, I was slipping away. So I naturally... Yeah. came away from it so Nothing i didn't away. yeah i never actually um never never saw it through and that's all right which is it? a good thing in the, as it's played out but yeah, yeah at the yeah. time yeah um there's things you need to take care of i guess at certain times so you naturally evolved towards kind of it, i guess that took you out of it didn't it so it got you back on track really because it you, did get me yeah um because you Moved so, towards grap. That was the point you moved towards grappling, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. So I, I, I then went back to the original plan, not through a conscious decision, but it just seemed to evolve that I went back. So at the same time as I was um, doing the boxing, I was also uh, doing my personal training qualifications, and I I met a lad on the um, on the course there who was a martial artist, and he invited me over to train in uh nelson over in lancashire this is gav noon and this is it? gavin yeah uh, obviously we both know gavin yeah um so at the same time as those, the boxing was falling away gavin uh we, we had a mutual interest in martial arts he invited me over says um you know i train a lot why don't you come over and we'll uh, throw a few ideas around so i went over there expecting you know i'd done it with several other guys before um you know, I was always up for a, a bit of extra training with different people, throwing a few ideas about. So I go over and uh, went over to Gavin's gym and I was just blown away by his ability, really, to be fair. Um, so Gavin is is probably one of the, I've, you know, I've been doing martial arts 30 years, probably one of the most skilled martial artists I've come across. And he hasn't, hasn't got one grade to his name, which is a, yeah. a big thing for me. It's It's... That's yeah. I find that fascinating and interesting. Yeah. So I got these guys out there who are world class, who have no badges, no qualities. They're just constantly seeking information and just better in their their skill set. Yeah, absolutely. So we went over there and he introduced me to some grappling and same as the boxing. As soon as I went down onto the floor doing any grappling, I was terrible, absolutely terrible, mm. tense. Um, trying to use brute strength to to lift him off, and I didn't have a clue, you know, fish yeah. out of water. Um, but then slowly you start to 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 learn the basics, and and then it evolved from there. So I start to become, you start to see the results of 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 your efforts and your training, um, and so I was full on onto grappling then. So I started to yeah. really look heavily into the grappling side of it, working with Gavin a lot. We used to go over there, train uh, regular with Gavin. Um, obviously, he's a great dear friend to this day. But um, so that was a really great, great transition. And also, he he wasn't just restricted to his grappling. He had he had a a good background and um, skill set in in things like Krav Maga and boxing as well. Mm. So it wasn't always just about the grappling. We we would we would do a full gamut. So it was yeah. uh, very very good. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Well, we're about halfway through now. And the thing, I mean, I've trained with you for a few years now. 
It seems like a few, but it's actually quite a while, isn't it? Like eight years? Yeah. Eight um, or nine years. Yeah, something. we've trained... Um, I'd yeah, say. we got you. Um, we got you really good with your hands at one bit. <laughs> <laughs> one bit. We've not done that for a while. Um, yeah, I will have to get back on that. I reckon. Um, but the bit that has drawn me more than any of it. I mean, I love doing all the physical side of it, and it's a great way to keep fit. And when you do start striking well or efficiently, should I say, then it is a good learning curve and you get a real sense of satisfaction. I always compare it to, to like, you know, a good golf swing. Like you just feel like you just know it's there and it's just, you're in, you're kind of in. Yeah. Fear. I mean, you, we've had, you break out in spontaneous bouts of laughter when you've hit a good shot. It's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Where did that go from? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, a brilliant reference point is golf. It is it's just like a, when you're a kid and you score your first goal in the top corner. It, it, yeah, well, that's it, the kind of wow. Whoa, what was, yeah, where did that come from? It's timing. Um, so when you hit that sweet spot, you, you know that yeah. you've you've you, you've where you are with it, and that's once you've done that, you've a reference point. Then yeah. you, you can take people back to that reference point. Yeah, I mean, joking apart, you. You you come with no experience. I mean, everybody knows how to throw a punch. I had but... plenty of experience of being, <laughs> being uh, in situations. But within a short time and and pointing out some of the basics, mm. you was hitting the pad very, very hard. We got you really good with your hands. Mm. Now, you didn't have the... If we'd have put you in a ring, you'd have got mauled. You know, you didn't have yeah, the combative yeah. and you don't know about... Yeah distance and timing and, yeah. and footwork and things mm. but that again you could learn them skills mm. but as a as a as a self-protection aspect and yeah. look, no now you know how to throw a punch you have a reference point yeah and that puts you in good stead um mm. for any unfortunate circumstances really yeah so it's um yeah but yeah sorry i drifted off there um but yeah i do i do, I do enjoy it um it's good. It's good. Something that's come to me in later life. I think I went to karate once when I was a kid and same as your first experience, but I never went back. I was like, nah. Yeah. I just, yeah. It just wasn't for me. I went, a kid who lived on my street, I went down with him. Wasn't really my kind of guy or my kind of kid at that time. So just all of it was just off for me. And then, I don't know, 20 years later, after a couple of incidents, you kind of think, right, and then knew what you were doing, uh, felt comfortable because I knew you through mutual friends, going to gigs, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, yeah, I'd say it's been one of my main training, um, my, my main routes of training, I guess. Yeah. Keeping fit and, yeah. and yeah, good way to de-stress as well, I guess. But the, the thing that I find really fascinating and was reading a lot about of it about at the time should i say uh while getting into that and still interests me to this day because it isn't about being a violent person is it it's, not all not it's all minimizing that uh, or or just um not even minimizing it's eradicating it you'd go in to eradicate any of that from your life yes yeah. I, I mean as you, as you know mike the physical side of it is probably ten percent of self protection, which seems a seems a v laughable when when you yeah. when you say that. But yeah, I'd say ninety percent of it is the warning signs, the feelings that we have pre fight, yeah. what vibes people are giving off, what signals are sending, all the triggers. There is a massive, massive build up to a, a violent situation and a violent encounter. Yeah. There's an internal dialogue going on on the aggressor, on the attacker. Yeah. And on some level, we can connect to that. We can pick up on these kind of signals that they are sending out. Yeah. And that's what interests me yeah. is avoidance. Now, that self, people say it's thrown out, that line is thrown away too quickly in self, self defense. It's about avoidance, but that's all it's about. If you become physical, if you have a violent encounter, You've missed something, in my opinion. Mm. And now I get that debated all the time. People say, oh, there's so many bad people out there. I didn't do anything yeah. wrong, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But I 
strongly believe on some level, if you are in a violent encounter, you have missed something. Yeah. You have missed something. Yeah. Now that's not to say that um, when it becomes violent that we can't fight back because the law states that we can. Yeah. And also and, preemptive striking and, is sometimes necessary. Sometimes, yeah. That that is again a, a, a grey area. But what we need to understand is what what violence actually is, and there's a lot of myths out there about violence. But if you commit a violent act, you there is going to be an investigation, and we need to understand that. So even though we believe we're doing it through self defence, yeah. if we are becoming violent, yeah, then we have we are also under the microscope. Yeah. We are also going to be asked questions, and we need yeah. to understand that. Yeah. So that's why we need to not get violent at all. <laughs> absolutely. Not, absolutely not get violent. Now, the myths out there about violence is violence begets violence, which is like saying that um, sickness sickness causes medicine. Well, yeah, it does to a, to, a, to a point, but violence is needed. A violent act is sometimes needed against violence. If I've got a crowbar coming, swinging in my head, mm -hmm. I need to be violent to stop that. There is no... In between, there is no in between. No. So, I, I, violence causes violence. Well, yeah. yes, yes. There's no verbal de-escalation point. It's reached intent. Yeah, and that intent needs dealing with. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but violence is is dictated by intention. Mm. So we need to know what the intent is. So the areas I look into again, it's not just this all all packaged into one. We look at things like we look at social violence and we look at asocial violence, yeah. which are already two different categories. Social violence is what you'd class road rage or what you're looking at. Outside a pub. Yeah, it's all yeah. about status and standing and squaring off and posturing. Yeah. And then you've got asocial violence, which is coming from sociopaths, psychopaths and top end rapes, murders, that kind of things yeah. that the odds are stacked heavily that you'll never even come across areas like that yeah but that's what we cover you know yeah. if, if people want to to look at these areas yeah then that's what we, we do cover so we cover make sure we're covering all aspects of of violence yeah. but on saying that i'll go back to my initial point there if you are becoming if you are in a violent encounter you've missed something yeah and that's what we go heavily into you've done the courses with me yeah i mean i missed i missed the uh the the, the seminar i guess you call it like uh, i think uh, my friend emma came down and sent her down she perfect example um she was a little bit intimid intimidated by um going down when it was uh, covering the physical side of things yeah and the first course she used to access the self-defense was the seminar on the psychology of violence which you run yeah which then made her see things differently she understood you a little bit more you understood her and then she came to a couple of correct yeah and, and yeah it can work like that can't it yeah which is fantastic yeah 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 absolutely i mean self-defense when when you look at you know what, what self-defense is it's you know it's it's the common law the english common law obviously it varies country to country but it it's it's stating that you are allowed to defend yourself so the law is saying you you are allowed to defend yourself but you've got to use necessary and reasonable force. Yeah. Now that statement's thrown out there. That's the law, and yeah, that's fine. But what you think is reasonable force and what you think yeah. is necessary is not necessarily what the law states. The measurement by which we gauge that is perception, isn't it? I yeah. Guess. I mean, are you are you in are you in a reasonable emotional state? That's what a yeah. Um, a defendant will will would say it would 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 work with. Yeah. Was you in um, a reasonable emotional state when the when the interaction happened? Yeah. Was it was the was the um, the violence you use necessary? Yeah. You think it's necessary because of the feelings and the adrenaline inside of you. Yeah. But just use for example, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's more of a controlling hold. But say you take somebody's back. Which is what you would promote in a self in a physical uh, altercation. Yeah, you'd you'd promote you'd get into somebody's back. You've got good control. And there's a lot of options. Yeah, but what a defendant would say there is that if you can get onto somebody's back, you can run away. Yeah. So it's already by using what I would say as a low level safe 
maneuver. Yeah. You're controlling. You're yeah. on the you're on the aggressor's back who started all the trouble. Yeah. Suddenly you're pulled to bits by a defendant by saying the, that you're already on their back and you yeah. could have escaped. And the, the so you're now yeah. you're now the aggressor. Yeah. And that's just, they're just examples. So you have yeah. to be really, really careful of how you state the law, Yeah. which I've been looking at on, I've had a bit of a gap from the courses the uh, last six months, but I've been doing a lot of study. Yeah. I've been reading up on the law because I need to understand it if I'm out there teaching it. Absolutely, yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, there is a lot of clubs out there and um, I guess it's high adrenal, isn't it? And some people can be drawn towards combative arts because they're like the high of of the violence. Yeah. Which is the complete opposite of your courses and what I'm into. It It's to reduce those adrenals in potentially high adrenal situations so that you remain balanced and seeing things... Um, from a way that works for society, I guess, so that you're not out, you know, yeah. being an aggressor. Yeah. Um, it's counterintuitive, that's what I'm saying. By 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 learning these things makes you a calmer person and... Um, oh, without a doubt, yeah. I'm, um, with the right approach. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah absolutely. Um, the, the, the more you learn how to be, how to do the physical side of it, the less you want to actually do the physical yeah. side of it in a real situation. Yeah, yeah. There is there is a process happening there that's yeah, is 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 often... almost showing you the delicacy of life. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean, you know, the basics of it, you know, it, violence is and it is a simple term, I guess, but a lot of people forget about it it is just base level communication isn't it it's yeah it's going you know using violence because they cannot verbalize and you know process um complex emotions that are going on within that um, that moment and it just be it's base level communication i don't like you i'm gonna hit you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's the yeah, it's a low form of communication um so it can be understood. That's that's the big teaching point. It's just be, it's people say, "Oh, mindless violence." It was it was out of control. Well, no. It, when it's dictated by intention, there's a there's a reason to every act. It's an emotional and physical expression. So mm. we can understand it. That's the thing that we need to look at. Yeah. And there, that's when you start to look at the the warning signs and the signals. So violence, yeah, it's base level communication. But it's as it's communication, without a doubt, we can understand it. And we need to just look yeah. into what is actually happening here. What is that person? What is their intention? What is this expression that's happening? Yeah. And what are the warning signs and what are the triggers and what are the feelings that yeah. it evokes? Yeah. And we yeah. can work with something then. We can work with starting to... And, and when I say violence, it's not just the physical. We're talking about... Um, words as well words can be as violent as yeah absolutely. as a hit yeah, you know yeah. as, as we all know people's lives are dictated by one comment you know and yeah. it, it can pass on they can pass it on to generation to generation yeah they can um, project that onto their children yeah so words are very very powerful again there is that they can be as violent as yeah. as the physical act yeah so again we need we work with things like that as well we look at how? And there's, ne there's never, this This is why it interests me so much, because there's never one route, because now we talk about words being violent and intimidating, but silence also can be, can't it? Yeah. I mean, when I've been in situations, the ones that were more severe were the prowlers that weren't saying nothing. Yeah. I could feel it. I could feel it coming. Well, the dog that's barking yeah. and, and chelping. Yeah. Is less dangerous than the one that's growling and walking slowly towards you. Yeah, so, or just sizing things up. And yeah. I could feel it coming for a good. I've got a, an incident at a train station in my mind, and I could, I could, I was kind of cornered in the car park and talking to other guys who were, with, but I could feel this guy's energy, and the conversation wasn't 
the conversation wasn't friendly as it was being portrayed by the two little chelping dogs. And then it turned. Yeah. Um, and that was just, I mean, you talk a lot about being in um, uh, red, amber, green. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was just dropping someone off at a train station and I just had a lovely time down in Cornwall, chilled out. And I was on, I couldn't have been any more chilled. And the situation just went from that into high alert. Yeah. And it's it's horrible. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's the interesting thing that, you know, it, it, it... Well, that's just the classic response. You've gone from zero to ten. Yeah. So your adrenaline dump has happened. And it was severe. I remember that one. Very, very so severe, severe, yeah. Because of because of how relaxed I was feeling and just within an instant it had changed. But when you start to look at it from another level and you, you, you're you then coming up to three and four, you've got an awareness going on. So yeah. you start to look for these kind of signs. And it's, you know, people say, is it paranoia? I don't want to be out there thinking these things. Mm. But we all get in a car and we all put a seatbelt on. It's, yeah, it, yeah. it's it's part of just be part of personal safety yeah. and awareness so let's be aware of the situation yeah but even that is only small as well when we look at, at where does awareness and feelings come from it comes from a subconscious which is far far more powerful than what's going on in your thoughts and your mind at the time yeah so if you are in a room and you and you've and you've got a feeling of mm. unrest that there's something negative when you're generally balanced generally because, balanced and you because, don't know why yeah, yeah. because if you if, if there's Listen other things to that. going on in the background that's where things can get blurred isn't it i mean if the, if there's i guess i guess each person's reality is, is is through perception and past experience but if you're generally in a good place and 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 everything's balanced and then your emotive senses are beginning to pick something up then you can kind of trust that there's something not quite right. I yeah. Mean, if you're over all over the place anyway. Yeah. You don't know. You know. You, you, that's where the paranoia comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. But when you're, you know, you've got a good a good level of balance. And this and these kind of skills is where when you start th- talking about a social violence, when if you're coming across a psychopath or a, or a, or a sociopath. They do not want a standoff. They don't want a competitive, competitive yeah. arena. They want an attack that is quick and gets the job done and efficient. Yeah. So there, there will the be no, there'll be no physical hard. pre-build. There'll be no posturing. Mm. There'll be no what you call the interview where they they actually interact with you. Yeah. It will be done with artifice and it will be done fast and furious. Yeah. Now. This is where we need to look into the feelings that yeah. we would sense that. Yeah. And that goes on a on a subconscious level, on a very, very powerful thing. Yeah. That listen to your gut, listen to yeah. your gut instinct, yeah. listen to why you're feeling like that. Yeah. Because these guys are not bothered. They when oh yeah, you look at a psychopath, ninety three percent of psychopaths are already in the criminal justice system. Yeah. So the acts don't go unavoidable that they, they, they will there will like, there'll be repercussions for them but yeah. the actual manipulation and the pre-build to actually doing the act yeah is done under stealth and artifice and it will happen very very fast and it will happen instantaneous yeah so if you have not listened to them feelings yeah that is your alarm bells ringing yeah yeah scary isn't it really? yeah but it's but, also very very rare very, very rare. rare yeah that that's the thing as well it's you know, it's not to make people paranoid that, you know, because what are the statistics? I don't can, Do you know them off the top of your head? For, for what? Sorry? For kind of violent encounters of that. Nature. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, well, when you, if you look at a top end violent encounter, the statistic is not point, not, 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 not 1% of you yeah. are being murdered. You have more chance of being squashed by a vending machine than <laughs> attacked by a terrorist in the US. And that's yeah. that's a fact. Yeah, yeah. You know, how many people get yeah. um, killed by terrorists? Yeah. More people get squashed by a vending machine. Yeah, yeah. So they, these are facts, you know. Yeah. Obviously, the media... <laughs> yeah, we don't yeah. have front page news about somebody getting squashed by a vending machine. Yeah. But we do about terrorism. So yeah. 
this is where we look at, you know, and you start to look at statistics on violence and yeah. violent encounters. The older you get, the less chance you have of, um, it's mainly young males, 19 yeah. to 24 year olds. Yeah. And, and obviously that's social violence. They're, they're bothered about status and, yeah, and yeah. standing. And, yeah. and that goes, you're starting to go into biological uh, yeah. growth and, yeah. And and um, trying to impress the the females and yeah. and and you can you can you can look into them kind of areas, yeah. but a violent encounter. I know this is what we're talking about today, and it can heighten um, your adrenaline, and it can um, send you know p get people quite fearful. Yeah. But it is very 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 rare. Yeah. You know if you if you have good social morals and a yeah. and a good moral compass, then. You're not, you're not going to drift you're not gonna, hopefully towards no. some areas and places where where it it gravitates towards. Do no. you know what I mean? No. I mean, I feel certain certain places now that I just don't go because I just <laughs> I just don't because it things seem to gravitate around all that that I don't want to be involved in and whether yeah. that's age yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and they, there's no denying that. So you know, if you like, you say if you're just following, if, but like, if it is, a, if it is actually, you want to be out, out of that world, then it's quite easy to move away from it. Really, yeah, once you're ready. yeah, yeah. We all know, you know, I'm not going to get any hassle down at the nice little coffee shop down the road <laughs> while I'm having my bacon butter. You know, like. Depends where you want to go, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, um, but I'm saying all, all that as well. I've, as you know, you've been along to the sessions. We have fun as well. You know, yeah, it's yeah. not. It's not just yeah. about. We talk about. Uh, it's relaxed and yeah. We talk fun. about horrendous situations and top yeah. end violence, but we do it in a in a relaxed yeah. and uh, good vibe as well going on. Yeah, that's definitely. it. That's important to me. Very important. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I mean, since you've been doing rich combat. Um, you know, like we'll just we'll end on this. We've got about five minutes left, something like that. Um, you know, like some of your students, like positive impact you've seen. You know, like people who you've trained who have come with you know difficulties or have been in situations or you've seen how it's kind of yeah um help them yeah. Hundreds of stories, but yeah, um, I think it's fantastic. I think you know, for all for all my talk on coming away from martial arts and styles and system, that's just because of where I am at the moment. But as a obviously my background's in karate, and I've only just stopped teaching that this uh, this year. But seeing seeing the progression of people going through the ranks and and getting their black belts and going through the the fear of competing for the first time or for sparring for the first time or teaching. I think it's just a fantastic process. Um, I've had, I've had young, young, young men come in who haven't even been able to look me in the eye. I've gone bright red when you've just asked them yeah. to a question and then go from walking out there with a black belt and yeah. a degree in the personal life and, um, yeah. and, flourishing in in employment it's transferable isn't it yeah to, absolutely to transferable life situations and you, you, your whole communication in interaction in general i think yeah so it's very very positive um excellent for for, for kids excellent excellent yeah. uh karate is for kids so as a lot of, as a lot of martial arts is but for the kids now it's it's a it's a fantastic arena for them um you know they're not really they're not learning about violence at all. Like I say, that's that's the reason I've stepped away from it. But the, what they are learning is is, is life skills. They're learning um, the fitness coordination, um, team bonding. So there's, you know, there's been some fantastic stories, and it's yeah. it's just brilliant to watch. Yeah, fantastic. Cool. So, just tell us what what you've got planned for. Well, not this year because we're at the end of it, but yeah. next year. So next year. I'm going to start the courses in start in January um and I'm going to be running them once a month or every six weeks if not and I'm going to be looking at putting a rank in there and instruct people who want to do to teach it I'm going to do an instructor rank I'm also going to do um, a grade system as well for people to 
to take a certification away. Um, so I'm going to bring that into that be second half of the year. But just going to be rolling out the classes once, once a month, and these are drop-in classes as well. So I try and make each cl- well every session is is always different. But I try and make it that you can walk in there with no experience, or you can have ten years experience, and you're going to take something from the session. So anybody can it's pay as you go classes. Just bob in, and it'll be a different subject every time we um, we Excellent. meet. So yeah, you can find all details for that on richcombat, is it dot com? Yep. Yeah. Uh cool. Well, let's leave it at that for today, mate. And uh thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice one. Cheers, Matt.